Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you on this sunny Sunday morning. And uh, we gather in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the most important hour of our week, as we sing together, pray together, hear words shared with us. And um, it's a great way to begin in celebration of the living spirit of Christ. We welcome members and friends of our congregation, and we especially welcome any guests that we have here this morning. If you are a guest, please know that that's what you are. You are not a stranger. You are not a visitor. You are our guest. This is your safe place to come together and worship God. If you find yourself seated at the end of the row, would you please see if you uh, find the friendship pad there and sign it and pass it along? <clears throat> It's an opportunity for you to not only record your attendance here this morning, but it's also an opportunity for you to list uh, any special needs that you bring to this worship service. A couple of announcements before we begin uh, our worship. Uh, the rummage sale was this weekend. More about that in a minute. Uh, one practical reality that uh, somebody left a set of keys here. Um, that Warren found yesterday. So if you're missing keys, we might have your keys. And since the uh, rummage sale was a great success again this year, I mean, literally, if it's not a member of our congregation, God knows, God only knows whose keys these are. So if you hear anything, uh, let us know. And now, just in a great spirit of gratitude and celebration, I'm so pleased to share with you that again this year, we raised over $10,000 for the rummage sale. Um, the latest figure I got was uh, 10 one so it's over $10,000 for our mission trip. And uh, the effort this year was uh, co-chaired by Lisa Watkins and Tina Baldoff. And I don't see Lisa here, but I do see Tina. So Tina, thank you so much. Can we hear it for <clears throat> And I already, Tina and I already had a quick chat this morning, and um, we're not, I'm not gonna try to name everybody who, who did so much hard work, but so many people went into this team, and um, it's, it's still new enough to me that I'm inspired, I'm sure I always will be, with the spirit of, of volunteerism and participation, uh, young and old alike. So Tina and Lisa and everybody, you know who you are. Thank you so much for all your excellent work. What I shared with the group uh, Friday morning as we began with our prayer is uh, Khalil Gibran said, work is love made visible. Work is love made visible. And that's what happened again this year through the uh, rummage sale. So thank you all so, so much. And with that, let us come together now in uh, our opening hymn, number 262, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Let us praise God the Creator. Let us worship God the Savior. Let us experience God the Spirit. Now please join me in the prayer of invocation. God of God God God, you who revealed Jesus to be your Son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit of his death, allow us to experience your power and grace today, that we may be fully in your call for our lives. Sharing your love and making disciples of all nations. Through Christ our Lord. Good morning. I would like to invite any children who are here today or anyone who feels young at heart to come on forward for our children's sermon. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, Case? Good. How's everyone doing today? Good. Good? We're doing great? Yeah. Excellent. Um, wow, we're very spread out. That's okay. I can work with this. So, I have a question. What? How many of you play a sport? You do? You do? What, what sport do you play, Case? Tennis and basketball. Tennis and basketball. Two sports. Okay. AJ? Cross country, Cross country and track. You are a runner. Uh, if you have not seen AJ run, it's because he was so fast and you blinked. <laughs> Amelia? Tennis. You play tennis. Excellent. I don't know if I knew that. Yes. A whole bunch of sports. Excellent. And what about you, Caroline? Soccer. You play soccer. Do we have any dancers up here? Is anyone a dancer? Yeah, you're a dancer? I'm a, I'm a good dancer. You had your recital yesterday? How did it go? You both had your recital yesterday? Oh, I hope there are pictures. You were in the same class. That's so exciting. OK, so we've got some dancers. We have some athletes. Um, how many of you just finished um, school? Yeah? What grade did you finish? Fifth. Fifth? What? Third. Third? You had to think about that, right? What grade did you just finish? Kindergarten. So you also finished kindergarten. That's how it works with twins normally. Now I'm in second grade. You're going into second grade. And what about you, Caroline? What grade are you? You just finished preschool. So you are going into elementary school. So let me think about this. That means that you guys are also students. Is that right? Yeah. So you guys are students and athletes. Is that right? How many of you are a child of someone? I got you. Yeah, you're all a child of someone, right? This. We're all children of someone, right? We all have, yes, in case it's something important to say. You have a boo-boo on your knee. We will pray for your boo-boo today. I'm sorry that you have a boo-boo. I think it will heal. It looks like it's going to be OK. It does. So all of you kids are more than one thing, right? You're a child. You, some of you are a sister or a brother to someone. Some of you are athletes and dancers and students. You are more than one thing in one person, right? Let me show you something. So God is also more than one thing. Let's see if this works. So today is Trinity Sunday, and Trinity Sunday is one of those Sundays during the year that can be really difficult to explain. 
right? What am I doing? Case, okay, so what am I doing over here? Yeah, I'm lighting a candle, and I'm going to explain why. So God is our creator, right? And God is also our savior, because God sent a little piece of God's self to this earth in a person called <coughs> St. Jesus. Yeah, so in a children's sermon, usually the answer to the question is Jesus, right? So... And God is also known as the Holy Spirit. What do you see when you look at this candle? What is that? Do you see the flame? It's my microphone. It's going a little crazy. You see the flame? It's a candle. So this is how I try to describe the Trinity. God is three things in one person. So there's a flame. If I put my fingers right here, what do you think I feel? Heat, right? I feel warmth? Absolutely. And if we turned off all the lights in this building and this candle were burning, would we see it? Why? Because it's light. Absolutely. God is a little bit like this candle because this is the flame and the heat and the light. But unlike this candle, if God never goes out, right? I could blow this candle out and then we wouldn't see the flame anymore. We wouldn't see the light and we wouldn't feel the heat. But God isn't like that. God is with us always. And we are all made in God's image. Have you heard that before? That we're created in God's image? Which means that we can be three things in one also. And sometimes God brings us to new adventures. And God calls us to try new things. And God says, you can do it. Because you are just like me. You can be more than one thing in one person. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for the light that you bring into this world. Thank you for the flames that, sets our, that set our hearts afire, and thank you for the warmth that you bring into our lives. We pray today for Cases Boo Boo, and for all of the ways that we're hurting God. Bring us healing. Make us whole. We pray all of this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Spirit. Amen. You guys can sit with your families. And so on this Trinity Sunday, I invite you now, if you are able, to please stand and greet one another in the passing of this morning's peace. We come now to our time of sharing of joys and concerns and a moment in prayer. And it is my joyous duty to lift up the gift of our beautiful flowers this morning. The flowers to your right are given uh, by Greg and Jane Hadley as they say goodbye. So this is a joy. It's also uh, Joel's, wait, when you're saying no? Oh, I got the flowers wrong. I thought you were saying I got the Hadleys wrong. I, it's, a, it's a lot easier for me to deal with the flowers being wrong. You're right. You're right. The spirit is at work. I looked up. You know, it's always a problem when you're standing in the pulpit and you see somebody going like this. Okay. This, these flowers here are given <laughs> to, uh, uh, by uh, Greg and, and Jane Hadley. And uh, as they say goodbye, which is sad. But it's a joy. Uh, they're moving to be closer to family, and uh, we expect to see them in the service um, uh, 
the second service today. So we'll have the opportunity to grant them our love and our Godspeed. So um, please reach out to them uh, and, and grant them Godspeed. And now, these flowers are given uh, in celebration of Amelia Douglas's ninth birthday, which is Thursday. Is that right? Amelia's here. So everybody wave or something. <laughs> Amelia is going to be, gosh, she's getting so old, nine years old. She'll be driving soon. And, and, but uh, happy birthday Thursday to Amelia. And uh, I'd invite you to take a look at uh, the just inside the next to last page, if you will, this week in our prayers. I want to lift up a joy. Some of you know this, but not everybody does, actually. Um, Beginning this, technically this fall, uh, Susan Langner will not uh, be our youth leader anymore. She'll be our, I gotcha, she'll be our student pastor. So that was mean to me, I shouldn't have done that. She's gonna be our student pastor, which will include uh, youth ministry. So she's with us, she's gonna have more duties. This is done in, con in conjunction, three entities bring this about, our congregation, uh, the Central Southeast Association and um, uh, MTSO, the Methodist Theological Seminary in Ohio. Those three entities come together and the, all of next, for the next school year, Susan will be our student pastor. This is a great, great thing for us as a congregation. It's certainly something that I lobbied for and Pastor Zigrid lobbied for and the council is on board with this. And um, so that's a joy. And um, today is the first time Susan is going to have the opportunity to preach. So uh, that's what's happening today. And it won't be the last, the good Lord willing. Try not to take too much for granted. I don't mean you, I mean, but uh, the good Lord willing, we're going to hear many in, in the future. So uh, thank you, Susan, for all you do and all you're going to be doing for us. Um, taking a look at the names, uh, had a really, really great visit with Ann Blaisdell a couple days ago. She's feeling a lot better, hoping to go home maybe in 10 days or so. I'm also very pleased to report that Linda Cushmall is doing much better. Um, she's at a new rehabilitation center in Columbus, and they're having a very positive experience there. And uh, as late as yesterday, the report is she's getting better every day. So let's, let's hope that continues. Are there other joys or concerns to be lifted up at this time? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Blessings on his living spirit. Let us come together in a moment of spoken prayer. Lord God Almighty, in a few moments, we will hear the words of Jesus where he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And Lord God, if anything at all happens here today as a result of our gathering in worship, let it be that we acknowledge the living spirit of Christ being the ultimate authority in our lives. It is so tempting and so easy to forget Christ and to think we're all on our own and that it's all up to us and that we have to be sharp and to be good. And Lord God, of course, it's good to be sharp and it's good to be good but the Lord Jesus Christ is the authority in our lives. Teach us and remind us as a result of being here today, through our songs and through our sermons and through everything that we do, that the Lord Jesus Christ coming to us in the form of God and the Son and the Holy Spirit is the authority in our lives. We have prayed for those with our lips and we pray for those in the privacy of our hearts we pray for our congregation, we pray for our city, our nation, and our world. May everything that we think, say, and do today, Lord, 
be pleasing in your eyes. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray all of these things in your name, saying amen. We come now to our time of offering, and if, if, I, if I could, if I could figure out a way, I would put in a bottle uh, all of the loving energy that was abounding in our church uh, surrounding all of the events uh, of the, of the uh, rummage sale. And you know what? We can do that. We put it in a bottle. It's called the Living Spirit of Christ, and it's within us at all times. And that's why we exist as a congregation, and that's why we are called to be generous in all things, in our time in our talents and in our treasure. Let us come together now in the sharing of this morning's offering. In the name of God, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit on this Trinity Sunday, we lift up these offerings to you, Lord. We ask you that you bless them so that they may mysteriously bring the presence of Christ through whatever means in the way that you deem 
We pray all of these things in your name, saying, Amen. The Old Testament reading for today is Psalm number 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The New Testament reading for today is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This ends the New Testament reading. Thank you, Mike. Good morning. It's a little different standing up here when it's not for a children's sermon. I'm going to start by asking you all to do something a little unusual. Humor me. Can you take a look at your shoes, please? Go ahead and take a peek at your shoes. Maybe look at your neighbor's feet, see what they've got on. This is about the time someone realizes they're wearing mismatched socks. That's OK. I won't tell anyone. What do your shoes say about you? What are your shoes designed to help you do today? Gentlemen, have you got your loafers on? Ladies, maybe you're wearing your fancy sandals because, well, it's Sunday and a church day, but it's summer, so to heck with closed-toed shoes, right? Perhaps when you get home, you'll put on whatever it is you plan to garden in later today. Maybe you've got a jog in your future, so you'll lace up your sneakers. My point is that our shoes equip us for what it is we are setting out to do, for the journey we're preparing to take. I have brought three pairs of shoes with me today because it's Trinity Sunday. So these lovely flip-flops are the shoes that I wear for most of the summer. These, whoa, <laughs> these are really good momming shoes. So when I need to quickly walk the dog or go fill up an inflatable pool in the backyard, I wear these. And yet they're sturdy enough to drive a minivan. Very important when you're momming in the suburbs. These shoes get a lot of use. These are my trusted sneakers. Aren't they lovely? I've run a few miles in these. When I have a midsummer youth event or when I'm working a rummage sale, I put these on. They're comfortable, they're sturdy. In my role of youth director, I can be very active in these particular sneakers. These, and along with my uh, work boots, will get quite a bit of use in the next few weeks at our mission trip. And like my sandals, those sneakers are comfortable and reliable. I know exactly what they feel like. I know where I'm going and what I'm setting out to do when I wear those shoes. But today, I am literally wearing a brand new pair of shoes. I call these my preaching pumps. 
and they are uncomfortable. When I put them on this morning, I was hesitant. I always thought that if I was meant to be taller, God would not have made me five foot three, so why bother wearing heels? Truthfully, though, I don't think it was just the thought of newing, wearing new, uncomfortable shoes that made me so uncomfortable on the inside. Standing behind this pulpit and preaching a message to adults rather than to teens is new for me. This is a new role. The thought of becoming a student pastor is what made me uncomfortable. But today I embark on a new journey, and it calls for a kind of transformation and new shoes. But I assure you, I am the same Susan wearing these pumps as the Susan who wears the sandals and the sneakers. And believe it or not, this actually brings me to today's lesson. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is doing two things. He is equipping his disciples for a new role, and he's explaining just how to perform that new function. First, let's set the scene. The resurrected Jesus calls his disciples to Galilee, where he meets them on a mountaintop. And if this sounds familiar, it should. Jesus did a whole lot of really important things from a mountaintop. Knowing that his ascension was imminent, Jesus gathered his disciples to give them a final set of instructions, and we call this the Great Commission. He assures them of his power, he gives them this commission or special instructions, and he promises his presence three objectives in one sermon. Three in one. It must have been difficult, though, preaching to a crowd of his own friends, knowing that some of them doubted him. Did you catch that part of the reading? Verse 17 reads, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. It's subtle, but here the gospel writer makes a point to tell us that even after he's been resurrected, some of Jesus's friends still have reservations about him. The man has performed miracles, he has come back from the dead, and he's fulfilled Jewish prophecies, and yet his buddies doubt him. Some of them are still uncertain. But don't lose sight of the fact that despite their uncertainties, they still worshiped him, worshiping a God who we love and sometimes doubt. Worship and doubt are not mutually exclusive. I wonder if these disciples were thinking, can he really do for us what he says he'll do for us? Does that resonate with you? That resonates with me. Admittedly, even as a seminary student who feels authentically called to ministry, I sometimes have my doubts. Can Jesus do for me what he says he can? But what if we turn that question around? What if we ask, can I really do for God what God says I can do? Perhaps the disciples were not merely doubting Jesus. Perhaps they doubted themselves and their own ability to live up to Jesus's expectations. Perhaps they doubted they were able to fulfill the job he was calling them to do. If Jesus, if Jesus's message was to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, what did that mean for the disciples? These disciples had never baptized anyone. There were some jobs in ministry that were left up to John the Baptist and Jesus. But John has died. And Jesus knows that he's about to ascend, leaving the physical world. Ministering to the people is up to his followers now. He's passing the torch, so to speak. But baptizing people? Performing this kind of act would have been a new function for the disciples. Jesus was calling them to do something new, something different, something that made them uncomfortable. He was disrupting their lives. I know a little something about this kind of disruption. In November of 2015, I was with a bunch of youth and high schoolers at Pilgrim Hills Campground. I was part of a planning team for what's known as the Fall Youth Event, when youth from churches in the Ohio Conference of the United Church of Christ gather for a weekend retreat. We had about 12 kids from our church there, 12. And for Sunday morning worship, the planning team had divided up the tasks and roles. 
Several of the leaders were ordained pastors and one was already in seminary, so I had encouraged one to preach the sermon and another to consecrate and serve the elements. I thought, I'm not a pastor. Let's leave these important tasks up to the people who know what they're doing. They've done this before, they're professionals, they've been called. And then something happened. I heard a youth member from another church ask her pastor a question. I can't even recall the specifics of the question. It had something to do with how she, the youth, could participate in the worship. But the pastor's response is what I remember. She looked up and said, ask Susan, she'll know. I just paused and I let those words sink in. An ordained minister had sent her student to me for an answer. And then it dawned on me, maybe I'm not so different from these pastor types. <clears throat> Truthfully, I had started having this inkling, this sense deep inside that God was nudging me toward ordained ministry for several months, maybe even years. But it was that weekend at Pilgrim Hills when I felt it the strongest. And yet, I resisted it. I worshiped God and yet I still doubted what God was telling me to do. To become ordained means going back to school, unless you plan on doing it online. And I didn't want to do that. I am a wife and a mother and a youth director, and now, God, now you want me to become a student too. Can I really do what God tells me I can do? God the Creator made us and is always in the perpetual process of creating us, helping us to become new versions of ourselves. God the Savior sent Jesus to save us from ourselves and to be God with us, present with us always. And God as Holy Spirit sometimes makes us a little uncomfortable, impelling us forward to try new things, disrupting us and our normal. But remember I said that Jesus was not only equipping his disciples for their new role, he was telling them how to perform that new role, that new function of ministry. He was telling them, baptize everyone and do so in the way that I minister. <laughs> do this like Jesus did that. Those are some big sandals to fill. Notice when Jesus says to make disciples of all nations in this passage, there are no instructions to cherry pick who is worthy. No call to judge one's value to the kingdom of God. This kind of inclusivity was pretty radical for the time. The Gospel of Matthew often highlights this culture of who's in and who's out. In this way, the ancient Holy Land and modern society might not be altogether different. The author writes about the Jews and the Gentiles, Jesus' followers and the non-believers, the educated Sadducees and Pharisees versus the lower class. Yet, here Jesus is commissioning the disciples to baptize all nations, all people, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What Jesus is really telling these disciples is, in my absence, your new role is to do what I've done. Show love to everyone. There is no us versus them. There is no who's in and who's out. Everybody's in. What does that mean for us today? What do we do with that here at Westerville Community United Church of Christ? We minister to everyone. Everybody's in. It's the essence of being the ever-widening circle of Christ's love. Let's go back briefly to Pilgrim Hills 2015 at that fall youth event. Among our own church youth attending was a young lady named Zainab. Some of you might remember her. She was a young lady from Pakistan, an exchange student living with the Schneider family that year. Shortly after arriving here in the United States, Zainab asked me if she could come to Sunday school. I'm Muslim, she said. Is it okay if I come to your class? I'd like to learn more about the Bible. The older, the youth and I, of course, welcomed her graciously because that's what we do. And over the weeks, it became a great exchange of information about our faiths. Then it was time to travel to Pilgrim Hills, and Zainab asked if she could join us. Of course. And as you might expect, pastors and kids from churches were glad to have her with us. In the midst of great national and international strife about religion, can you guess what the theme was for that year's Fall Youth event? Miracles. 
they still happen. The theme was miracles, and we brought a Muslim to a student Christian youth event. Not only that, but Zainab was so moved by the reception that she'd received that she asked if she could speak to the entire group on Sunday morning. Our beautiful Pakistani friend stood up and told us the miracle that she had experienced that weekend. She said that in many places of this world, she would not have been welcomed. She had been denied entry to events because she was a female. She had been denied acceptance because she was a Muslim. She'd been rejected because she was from Pakistan. But at Pilgrim Hills, she said, this group of Christian youth and adults welcomed her, invited her in, shared our faith with her, and asked about her own. It was our own miracle. That weekend was transformative for me. I felt the trust and confidence of a pastor when she sent her student to me and said, Susan will know what to do. It changed how I see myself and the role I'm capable of in ministry. Zainab's words about experiencing the miracle of acceptance reminds us that we are capable to ministering, of ministering to all. She reminded us that making disciples of all nations means everybody's in. Sometimes, as individuals and even as a church, we find ourselves called to or even thrust into uncomfortable circumstances. Sometimes we feel uneasy, like we're being disrupted. New shoes are uncomfortable. Trust me. But we come to church and we worship together, doubts and all, to see how we will be remade, moved forward, and to feel God among us. We come because this is where God often gives us our next great commission, and it's where God equips us for the journey ahead. And when it's difficult to become something new, like a student pastor, we remember that because God is creator, God is savior, and God is the Holy Spirit, and we are made in God's own image, we too can be three things in one. Who is welcome? Everybody. Everybody's in. We can do what God is calling us to do. We can minister like Jesus, making disciples of all nations. Do you hear that still, small voice urging you to do something new? Do you feel compelled to take a new journey? Do you sense how you might welcome and serve the way that Jesus would? It could be God speaking, giving you your next great commission. Scary as it may be, Try on some new shoes. See how they fit. Break them in. Walk a new path in them. You aren't walking alone. Jesus said, I will be with you always. Believe in those words and step out in faith. Amen. Thank you, Susan, and to hear these wonderful words of inclusivity, how appropriate it is that we come now to our time of Holy Communion together. If you're new to us, please know that we celebrate what is known as Open Communion. All persons of all backgrounds are invited to receive. You do not have to be a member of our church. You simply need to be someone who is hungry for the new life of Christ. This includes all persons of all ages, including our children. We're going to be celebrating through the form of intention this morning, which means you're going to be invited to come forward. There's going to be two stations, bread and cup here and bread and cup there, and in the middle will be a tray of uh, gluten-free uh, bread and also individual cups if you choose not to uh, dip into the common cup. It is a good thing to stop and remember that ultimately we are called to this table not because we are worthy, although the Spirit is pleased at our attempts at worthiness, but rather we are called to this table simply because we are hungry. All those who hunger and thirst after the new life of Christ are invited to receive. Would you join me now in our response as it is printed for us in our bulletin this morning? We come to this sacred table not because we must, but because we may. We come to testify not that we are righteous, but that we sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his disciples. We come not because we are strong, but because we are weak. 
not because we have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in our frailty and sin, we stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. We come not to express an opinion, but to seek God's presence and to pray to know God's spirit. Amen. And so I lift up to you now I lift up to you now the words of institution as they were first recorded for us by the Apostle Paul, who said that on the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And after he had blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, Again, after giving thanks, our Lord Jesus Christ took the cup and he poured it out. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for you. Take, drink all of it. As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's life. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we lift up to you now through prayer and supplication these simple elements of bread and cup. And we ask you that you set them apart for the holy use which you have intended, so that as first bread and then cup pass our lips, they may enter our souls and we may receive the new life of Christ. Lord God Almighty, you gave your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And while he was here, he gave us his prayer which we pray together now saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory forever. Amen. Let us dine with Christ now together.
Is there anyone who needs to be served in your seat? Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we are grateful. We are grateful that we have dined together from food supplied from your table. We are grateful that we have received the new life of Christ. And we are grateful that we are ready now again to leave this place transformed as your disciples. Amen. As is our tradition now, I invite you to reach out and hold the hand of someone near you so that we can sing our closing benediction together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.